is uh, the crowding out problem. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting issue you raised. I'm restating it. Do, do, you, do people think that there is a big problem of crowding out? But one feeble hand. Not, not so much. If you put a bag <laughs> over your face, would we have a different vote? Johnny, um, before I turn to Stuart and ask for the role of foreign capital in helping India get its infrastructure to act together, can I just ask you to repeat to the audience the insight that you shared with us earlier when I was asking you about the opportunity cost of delay? A few years ago, capital was so much cheaper, and investors in developed market had such emerging market fever. What do you think happened? Why do you think they didn't come to India, and how much, how costly will that prove, do you think? Well, I think that, that uh, capital came to India, but perhaps not to the extent that one could have expected, given the size of uh, the, the, the country, the economy, and also the and growth, why? Why and is the growth that? potential. Well, I think that you are a little bit complicated. Honest, you, you, when, 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 when we look at you, we are also lending money to, in some small portions to India. When we look at India, you seem to us sometimes very complicated and difficult to understand. And I think you destroy a little bit of your potential uh, in this respect. Now, having said that, one should remember that your economy has been growing by 8 to 9 percent, which is a very good record. So I don't know how much, uh, much better you could do. But what you could do much better, uh, potentially, is to make more effective inst investments and to use this money to create more potential growth for the future. And in this respect, I th think that the financial uh, system is, is, is very uh, important. And also, let me add the question. I think that there's a feeling that it will take uh, at least a few years in order to deregulate the financial sector. Well, I was very heavily involved in that in myself in, in my own country. And I must say, with the benefit of hindsight, I think, think that we took much too much time uh, for, the, uh, for the deregulation process. Because at some stage, uh, you, become, you start to live in a no man's land. I used to say that it's difficult to be half pregnant uh, because you are in a position which is not very well defined. Uh, and it is very difficult to understand, also for policymakers, how the financial markets are actually working and how the policy, uh, policy measures are actually impacting on the macroeconomy. And it also give easily rise at a certain stage to different kinds of, call them gray markets or abnormal markets in transparent markets, which are difficult to follow. And if that is the case, uh, then you, of course, also are bound to create inefficiency into the system. So my experience is that after a certain stage, one should move rather quickly into the final stages of deregulation, but make sure that the regulatory framework at that stage uh, is in place. And also the tax system needs to be adjusted at that stage in order not to uh, give uh, wrong incentives into the behavior in the financial market. I think that's a great point in the whole context and everything having to be coordinated. Um, Stuart, will foreign capital come in to help India get its infrastructure act together? And will it be much more costly? Um, in, in my mind, there is no doubt that it will come in, providing that the environment is there for it. Now, the capital is, is going to come in, in in a lot of different, different forms. Because essentially, if we're talking about a trillion dollars of infrastructure spending, uh, over the current five-year five-year plan, then um, you know India can't fund that from from savings. So it, uh, there will be a dependence upon uh, foreign capital to come in. So there's obviously what will come in through F FDI. There will be what will be necessary through um, specialised financing, your, your uh, ECA type financing, which will be very important for uh, for a number of the large uh, infrastructure projects. Then there's also going to be the financing which will be required, both the bank financing but also bond financing, and that will be both at a project level, but also uh, I think there'll also need to be bank financing at a government level, bearing in mind the amount of, of government investment that is going to be required in infrastructure, either directly by the central government or, or, through, uh, or, or, or through government uh, agencies. So there, I think there'll be a number of levels in which it will come in. So. Um, because it will be necessary, it's important to ensure that you build an environment that is both going to encourage that funds to come in. So that means 
um, regulatory, regulatory reform on the capital market side. Uh, it means fast decision making, particularly in terms of uh, FDI coming in. It also requires some tax reform as well to ensure that foreign investors who invest in India um, get an appropriate after-tax return. And uh, both the, the cost of that in terms of withholding tax as well as constraints under FEMA um, just make life uh, a little bit difficult for, for, for a number, number of foreigners. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of work that needs to be done, but if it's, uh, if it's uh, put, in, put in place, then I think that foreign capital will be a key ingredient to India having a consistent 8% rural GDP growth. Thank you. Given how important infrastructure is, I'm going to spend a little more time on it before we move on to other topics. Rajat, I was talking to some of the bankers earlier in this trip to India, and they were saying, at the moment, it is almost impossible to get people to fund either roads or thermal power. Do you agree with that? Is that too pessimistic? Well, I think there are issues. So let's not say that we are uh, completely, uh, I would say, bankable. Uh, we are talking and why about is that? Well, I think we need demand side reforms as well. I mean, uh, the, the users have to pay a fair price for use of infrastructure. So I think we are currently is challenged. Power sector in, in India is at the moment challenged by inefficiencies in distribution and collection. Uh, we have uh, the state bodies that distribute power that are not for either effort reasons or political reasons not able to collect the fair price for the power that, uh, that they're selling. And we're already blending power. So we're already paying uh, expensive, uh, uh, let's say, prices to blend in wind energy, blend in solar energy, and, and, and we are not collecting uh, the, the right price from the end user. So I think there, is, uh, there, there would be demand side uh, reforms also required. I think, uh, in my view, I think what has worked very well for India in our recent evolution is privatization. If you've tracked the Indian telecom sector, uh, 20 years ago we didn't have phones. In, many of us growing up didn't have phones in our houses. And now we have uh, sea change. If you look at Indian banking, I mean, we, we were talking about um, nationalization. Uh, so we, we converted all banks into government entities in, in late 60s, and now we uh, privatize the banking all over again. So I think we need those reforms. I think we need to privatize uh, power distribution as well, so that we can bring in the private public partnership into some of these, uh, these areas to extract efficiency. We're not saying is that we need everyone to pay a higher price. It's a great point. We can do it uh, more efficiently. Yes. Now, the reason that you're on this panel is because you can talk about things as an academic in a far more direct manner than some people. I was in New York on September 17th, and I was at an Indian infrastructure seminar sponsored by the U.S. India Business Council. And the executive vice president of the council was saying that foreigners do not want to come in because they fear that they will not get paid. Have you heard similar things? You know, uh, not really, Henny. Uh, I mean, there are hindrances, and I, I'm sort of echoing what was just mentioned, is that our transparency of regulations is often not adequate. People need to understand. It's not just quite the content of regulation, but the transparency. But the risk of not being um, uh, able, to, not being repaid or not being able to collect, I don't think is there. What Rajat just mentioned is true. It's not that there is a default, but you know that there are some sectors in which we don't have a system in place for collecting at all. So you're, when you're investing in electricity, you know that we are just very bad at collecting dues from users. But there are a couple of sectors where we have had success, like road building, where we give it out to the private sector, allow them to charge tolls for the next 20 years. And at least in and around Delhi, this system of public-private partnership in roads has begun to pay off. So there is a change taking place, and I, so I don't think really there is a default risk in the case of India, India is a very safe country that way. But sluggishness, lack of transparency, those things do trouble us, but hopefully things will improve. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, the other area that I want to talk about is whether there is concern, and this is something that comes up all over the world, uh, that small and medium enterprises are getting the access they need to capital at affordable prices. Rajat, I'm going to turn to you once again on that one. No. 
uh, I think the, the, the capital is uh, very limitedly available to uh, the SMEs, as we call them. I think frameworks are also absent. Uh, it's only been, I think, three, four years that we've had credit bureaus uh, established uh, in India. And I think the, there is a lot more room for uh, the uh, credit, at least the credit from the banking sector standpoint, delivery to, to improve, to, for it to become affordable. We're already talking about an SME exchange. Uh, so there should be an opportunity for SMEs to have a, a carved out infrastructure for themselves so that they can uh, use that to uh, raise capital. Um, how, how does that work exactly? Uh, it's, it's, it's still a work in process. Uh -huh. it's, uh -huh. it's not something that we have seen uh, fructify or, or, or let me say haven't seen the success of, of that, that, that takeoff. But I think there is also uh, systemic support as well. I think a lot of the uh, VS banks are required to lend 40% of our resources to uh, certain directed uh, uh, se uh, sectors, if I may say. And a lot of them are actually small and uh, medium enterprises, farmers included. So there is, uh, I mean, sometimes it actually gets a little bit um, of the quality of what used to be quota system. So it, it does get the, the demerits associated with the quota system as well. But, but I think there is, uh, I mean, the more, the, every space that I look at in the country, I think I find there is room for efficiency. There is room for uh, transparency. Uh, and governance, I think, and all of that will make cost of capital cheaper in the, in, in the, in the medium term. I, I, don't, I don't see it happening sooner than that. Yeah. You know, Yes Bank and the FT were talking for so many months before this conference, and the environment has changed so much since then. So I'm going to depart from the narrow focus of this panel to take advantage of Heidi and Stuart and Johnny to ask them, you know, Asian growth depended on bank credit so much. Are there going to be capital constraints going forward which will make Asia's growth less certain? What, what do you see, Heidi? I see that there's a huge amount of capital constraint of the world's biggest banks. I think, I think um, you know, th th thankfully JP Morgan has continued to be able to lend and has actually grown their portfolios here. But if you look across Europe, um, you could see that many of the very traditional largest lenders to emerging markets, in including Asian emerging markets, are going to suffer from their own capital constraints, um, given that they're thinly capitalized relative to the issues that they have with the the European sovereign crisis. This is bound to create constraints about lending to, to different markets. I might just give her the microphone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is so, so interesting. Yeah, so, so I, 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 my expectation is that there'll be a clear pullback, just as hedge funds, which I alluded to before, had been leveraged very significantly, had been major players in, in emerging markets, capital markets. Now, over time, they've been replaced increasingly by uh, pensions and, and endowments and the like, but longer term, uh, but longer okay. term money. Um, European banks will probably, I would expect, to play a lesser or less, perhaps not as fast growing as it had been in the past. We're accepting HSBC. A absolutely, absolutely accepting HSBC. One, yeah. oh, again, one of the few. Um, but, but clearly, it's, it's going to be an issue for some of our, our um, uh, uh, banking brethren, so to speak. Um, and so that's going to be part of the new world, a different, uh, different um, uh, uh, pricing for sovereign risk, different, I think, uh, concern about geopolitical risk. Again, Asia is perhaps more um, insulated from some of this, but, but as we've learned in the past few years, no one is totally insulated from problems from one region to the next. Stuart, um, do you share Heidi's concerns? Uh, look, there's absolutely no doubt that um, since 2008, the, the biggest change in the bank industry has been around capital and the amount of capital which institutions will, will have to uh, hold now. Um, you know, it would have been typical that four years ago um, you know, a, large, uh, a large international bank could hold 6% of uh, core tier one capital, put in some hybrid capital, have its tier two capital and have an appropriate capital level. That just won't occur now. And depending on your size and whether you're a SIFI, depending on what your local regulator will impose, you could very well need um, uh, a, a minimum tier, core tier one capital of 10%. So that has a huge impact upon 
what is going to be the returns on equity that investors can realistically uh, obtain. So it's, it'll essentially make the banking industry less attractive uh, for, for uh, fund, fund managers. So there will definitely be the constraints uh, on, on that front. Um, I think also turning um, the other thing that's going to have an impact, and we're seeing it in Europe at the present time, with the turmoil that's uh, occurring there, um, banks suddenly have to recapitalise. Now, how are they doing it? They don't want to go to the capital markets, either because it's too expensive or their existing shareholders mm -hmm. don't want to dilute. So there's only one alternative. They have to run down their risk-weighted assets. And, of course, what you'll naturally do in terms of trying to run down your risk-weighted assets, you're going to do it in the offshore markets because you will not want to do it in your domestic markets, either for um, political reasons or because of pressure from your, from your, your core shareholders. Now, the, the thing which I think we're going to have to watch in Asia over the next 12 months is what impact is that going to have on liquidity in Asia? Mm. Will it mean there will be less funding available in Asia? You know, we're already seeing a very tight situation in terms of US dollars. The availability of US dollars, the cost of US dollars has gone up quite significant, significantly uh, in Asia, and that's a phenomenon which I don't see changing in, in the near future. So it's, a, it's an interesting environment that we're going into. Um, I, guess, I guess the um, people who believe that uh, markets will fix themselves will say the result will be that there will be a better, uh, more efficient allocation of capital. Um, I'll leave that to others yeah. to judge but whether that will be the case. Can I want to add something to what, what you said? Please, because, but because clearly Stu and I are in agreement. But we have to also think about um, uh, alternative investment vehicles, mutual funds, asset managers. I mean, from uh, where I sit in the U.S., there's a huge demand for, for Asian paper, for mm -hmm. infrastructure funds, where there's transparency, to Raja's point, where the, you know, investors who are searching for yield in, in ways that they can understand, not to derivatives products actually are really interested in power plants and roads. But, but again, you have to wrap that in, um, in the right regulatory framework. So it, it may not be bank direct lending. That may be constrained, as, as I agree with Stuart. But there are alternative sources of capital um, uh, available from investors, not just FDI. And we shouldn't ignore that. We should understand when we talk about a regulating a, a banking environment, the capital flows are just not uh, uh, directed through banks anymore, but through a huge array of alternative the vehicles. That's a great point. Thank you very much. Johnny, I'm going to turn to you um, with two questions. The Nordic banks had their crises early. They're in good shape. Do you see this as an opportunity? That's my first question for you. You mean for them or for... Uh, I think they learned their lessons. That's why they are in a good shape. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they went to Trump quite some traumatic... I think they learned two lessons. They went to a very traumatic uh, uh, situation in the early 90s. They had to rely on uh, government help. By the end of the day, in fact, they were able to repay all the help they got. Uh, but I also think that it was something they really wanted to make sure that they do not repeat. Uh, and as a result of that, they have also been active very much in the region doing this. With one of you uh, exemptions, they have been doing very much business that they really manage, taking risks that they have about.